What's come out after 40 some years is all this background and experience. And I have a PhD in global leadership and entrepreneurship. And through all of my studies, I'm able to kind of take the academic world and make it practical. Hey, this is Dennis Consorte at Snackable Solutions. And I have a very special guest here today, Dr. Troy Hall. How are you, Dr. Troy? I am doing marvelous, wonderful, and but I would say this, if I were any better, I think I'd be you. Well, I have to say, you've got an amazing shirt on. So if that's any indicator of your mood, I think we're in for a good conversation. Well, I live in Charleston, South Carolina, where even when it rains, the sun still shines. And so the turtles might be representative of finding them on the beach. <laughs> All right. Sounds good to me. It, in fact, it sounds inspirational. And I was wondering... You're a speaker, you're a motivator, you do all sorts of things. Before we get into your profession, why don't you tell me a little bit about what inspires you? It's kind of hard to maybe put it into some simple language, but I think what it really boils down to is because I spend so much time in leadership, what really inspires me is the opportunity to help others. I believe in the transformative principles of leadership that say you focus on someone else first and then self. I think that's an important aspect. I like to aspire people to vision and teach it. I'd like to get along with people. <laughs> I have a good sense of humor, sometimes maybe too good, but I'll work on that. I often say sarcasm is my second language, but you know, we'll kind of save that for maybe a little another time on the podcast. And I like to create this environment where people can trust me and I can really help them get what they want out of life. And I do that through my consulting and my executive coaching work. And so that, I think that really inspires me for that portion of work. And then art inspires me, music inspires me, writing inspires me. So there's all those other aspects that become, you know, part of me, travel, my family, all of those things would be uh, important too. Well, that sounds wonderful. So you're an executive coach. Tell me about that. Well, let's see. Well, we first start by saying, okay, so Dennis, tell me what you think is success and how will you think that will grow you? And so really being an executive coach is really helping people focus on their choices in life and what they want to do and what their aspirations, dreams, and objectives, where do they want to go? And then helping them get there. And a lot of what makes me a little unique in some of the processes, I really customize everything to the client, but I listen for things that people say, and I'm not afraid to challenge them a little bit. But I set up the conversation this way. If you ever coach with me, I equate it to trying on clothing. Are you up for me to ask you a question, even though you're the podcast guest, host? Yeah, 100%. I, I actually have a coach. So uh, you may throw me off, but let's give it a shot. Okay, good. Now, this is real simple, how we get, kind of get started. The first thing I say to you is basically we kind of decide we want to do this. I go, okay. So when I'm asking you questions and talking with you, I want you to think about it in the same way that you would try on clothing before the pandemic. So I'm assuming you tried on clothing to decide whether you wanted to buy it at some point in time in your life. Would that be true? Well, I'm not a very good shopper. My wife's very good at shopping. I'm pretty terrible at it. Usually I'm more utilitarian. If I need something, I just grab and go. Okay, good. And whenever you decide that something you don't like it, what do you do with it? Put it back up on the shelf and try something else. And try something else. You don't stomp up and down on it and you don't hate the person who gave it to you. Nope. Good, that's what coaching with me is like. I'm giving you clothing. And so I'm going to give you things to try on. I listen to what you say. I may challenge you a little bit. You may not like the wardrobe selection that I provided you, but I guarantee you it'll be something you'll want to try on. And then if you decide it's not for you, then we pass and move on to something else. Interesting. So how did you become a coach? What were you doing before? And what made you decide, you know what, this is what I really want to do when I grow up? I had this unique opportunity one time. Someone explained to me the concept of teachable moments. And it was really helping people around you in developing is looking for that teachable moment. And the teachable moment didn't have to be a bad thing. It was looking for the one minute good thing that happens and be able to explain it to a person in that short length of time. And so I really created this concept of me looking for these teachable moments in life with individuals to be able to share and What's come out after 40 some years is all this background and experience. And I have a PhD in global leadership and entrepreneurship. And through all of my studies, I'm able to kind of take the academic world and make it practical. And that's something else that really comes across for me within my consulting and the executive coaching part is actually making the information 
applicable and practical so that the person can do something with it right away, as opposed to having to pull together a bunch of parts and pieces before they can do anything. That sounds like a perfect fit for snackable solutions, because that's what we do here. That's right. Bits and pieces, right? That's it. I, I really like this concept. And, and I'm sure you've heard about this. There's this book called Atomic Habits. And every other person I talk to brings up this idea of becoming 1% better every day. And that's kind of what you're talking about, isn't it? it? It is. I mean, that's what the whole coaching aspect is. It's to really create the concept that you can be teachable. In the book, Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent, when I talk about the effective attributes of a leader who will lead this cohesion culture, the very first one I talk about is teachability. And there's uh, six others that come along with them, and they all work together. But if you're not teachable then it doesn't matter with some of the other pieces because it's not going to work because the mindset isn't right. When the mindset is ready for you to express and to accept new information from other people, to see others' points of view, not just to be stuck and grounded in your own, then you have the opportunity to have mindfulness, which allows you to then move forward with ideas and really create better collaboration with individuals you want to work with. What's interesting is uh, in speaking with another coach, one of the things that they brought up was the idea that sometimes you have these C-level executives and others who aren't very teachable. And sometimes you have to make up an excuse to get them in the room. And so one of the ideas was, well, if you want to do a training class with a bunch of people, you tell the C-suite, hey, we need you there to observe everybody else in the room, not because you need to be taught. Do you use tactics like that? Or do you find that the people who you bring as clients fit into a different category? Well, first of all, let me just say this. I, I sort of define that I have a persuasive style. So there will be things that I'll say or words I'll use that'll be persuasive, not manipulative. So all I want to say is that Anytime you're going to manipulate someone to doing something that they may not think they were supposed to be doing or wanted to do, you kind of run a little danger. It's a little bit of danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. So I think that being more authentic and genuine with individuals is true. But I can say this, with all of my years of experience, I could clearly say to a group of executives, your presence is needed because you need to hear what we're saying so you can reinforce it later. And if you get something out of it, then run with it. If you don't get anything out of it, then understand that you are affirmed in the fact that you already knew what we were going to cover. And I would have that kind of a conversation with people, but I would be very upfront and honest with them about it. And if an individual said that they didn't want to be a part of the group or didn't want to do it, that would create caution for me to decide, do I want to work with that client? Because all of our reputations are on the line. And the one thing that I really make sure is accurate is that the CEO is on board. If the CEO is not on board, then it doesn't really matter any of the programs that we offer. It doesn't matter any of the stuff that we do. The individual is really potentially going to sabotage it, whether they mean it intentionally or not. It's an unintended consequence because they haven't put their support to it. And as soon as someone says, do you know about this or do you understand that? And they don't know, they have that blank stare. It just ruins the whole thing. So if you have an executive team member who doesn't think that they should be a part of the program, that can be a dangerous red flag as well and something that you really need to address. That makes good sense. And when we talk about leadership, I feel like there are a lot of different leadership styles. Some leaders are coaches and mentors. Others are more authoritarian. There are different sides of the spectrum. When you look at your clients, is there a particular type of leader that resonates with cohesion culture? Well, it starts again, like I said, with the individual being teachable. They really have to have a mind for helping others. If the individual really approaches their leadership from, you need to do something for me, the likelihood is they're not going to be as immediate receptive to it. If they look at me and say, hey, I need you to come in and fix these people, that's usually a pretty good sign that things aren't going to go well because the fix these people concept is something that that person is speaking life to. And it means that they're not taking any accountability or responsibility for the leadership of where those individuals ended up being. People don't end up being a mess in an organization. They weren't hired a mess. And then we collect a big mess of people. We have contributed to those individuals not being as full or being as accomplished as they 
could be simply because the leadership has not done what they need to do to support it. And so I really am not interested in working with individuals who think that my consulting or coaching is a pill that they can give to the individual and they'll be cured and satisfied. I'm not interested in working with companies that don't want to create sustainability to what we have put forth into our efforts and activities. There are a lot of companies out there that are willing to do it. But interestingly enough, I will tell you that more clients that I have are those individuals who already know the right thing to do. They just need some additional help to get it going. Where those individuals who think they already have it done, they're not interested in thinking too much about it. And when I wrote my companion book, Fanny Rules, A Mother's Leadership Lessons That Never Grow Old, I did that to create a mentoring and a leadership book that also gave a little bit of transparency about me and who I am as a leader so they could kind of see who I am in addition to this guy who has some authority in this cohesion culture space. And in that book, Fanny Rules, there's 31 teachable moments wrapped around nine rules in the book. And one of the teachable moments is when the leader thinks they know everything, that's when the problems start. Yeah. Fanny Rules, how did you come up with that title? Well, it's my mom's name. So my mom was Fanny. So when I was 12 years old, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. I lived in a small rural town in West Virginia with poor economic conditions, limited education, and we were 30 to 45 minutes from the nearest hospital. And when mom was diagnosed with cancer, back 50 years ago, we thought mom was gonna die. And mom decided that she would hold off and have her surgery when I'd be able to take care of her during the summer. And it was during that summer, mom made a decision to live. And she says, this is what I want you to remember. She said, the choices that you make will always define your character, not the circumstances. She said, character is defined by choices, not circumstance. We were poor by circumstance, not by choice. I had cancer by circumstance, not by choice. I choose to live and I want you to live. And so she started to impart all of this wonderful wisdom to me during that time. Now, the good news for you, Dennis, and for those of you who are listening, is mom lived 43 years beyond that awful summer. However, later in life, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, with dementia. As a result of that diagnosis, mom was losing her memory, losing her motor skills, losing her life. And mom eventually was taken from us because she lost her memories. I thought, well, why not give them back? I have the power to do that. So I chose 31 teachable moments from my experiences with mom to wrap around nine rules that she gave me about the way you treat people and act and just all sorts of little things and created these little stories around it and then turned it into a mentoring guide so that other people who won't have the benefit of my mom and the bedside telling me these stories and telling me this information, they can use it. So Dennis, it's snackable pieces. It's these little stories that actually can be built into an opportunity. So instead of chapters, there's rules. At the end of each of them, there's actually a guide that you go through with a series of questions and answers you can do with a partner, uh, a mentor and a mentee, or you can do self-examination and ask those questions yourself and fill them out. That's great. And that, that sounds like a wonderful way to honor your mother. Uh, it sounds like she was very influential in your life. Were there other influences in your life that shaped who you are and the work that you do? Sure, there was another gentleman named Jack Williams that I worked with with a good number of years. And Jack, of course, has since passed away. But no, he was very influential in my life as well. Of course, my dad too, I shouldn't forget my dad. I had a great relationship with, with mom and dad. As a matter of fact, when I told my brother I was writing the book about mom, he says, well, don't leave dad out. And I said, well, okay, I didn't plan to, but mom's the star of the, uh, mom's the, star of the book, not dad. And uh, dad was more the protector and provider. Mom was the nurturer and caregiver. I got a combination of all those particular aspects of those roles and responsibilities pulled together. But I do want to give, certainly pay homage to Jack. He was really instrumental in helping me with my faith and helping me be a little more grounded in, in the corporate world and what I might need to notice to survive there. So 40 some years later, hey, I made it. <laughs> Good for you. So we spoke about some of your influences and we spoke about your work and we spoke about one of your books. Let's talk about your public speaking. You've been in front of some big audiences. You've got quite a network. Tell me about that. Well, I've just been very fortunate and blessed to be speaking. I started 
speaking internationally in 1999. I just have little opportunities that come up here and there. I've had the unique opportunity to visit 45 of our U.S. states and over 60 countries and multiple continents. And it just has really given me the opportunity to not only have a global influence from an academic perspective, but from a real life practical experience. And so those are just some of the things that have really, you know, shaped my life. And, and so as a result, I've spoken internationally and I speak locally and I do things for pro bono, but I also get paid to do it. And it's very rewarding to think about it. And every time I do the speech though, I always think about the individual's who I'm speaking to and making sure that my message is for them, not just a message for me. And one of the other things my mom taught me was, she says, whatever you do, do it your very best. She said, it doesn't matter if you wanna be a janitor. She says, I really don't care. She says, but I will say this to you, that you better be the best one. Because when I get out of this bed and I go to your place of work, I'm gonna check the corners because anybody can clean in the middle of the floor. And I wanna make sure that you've taken care of the corners. And so those life lessons remind me. And so I had this interesting perspective. It was really a paradigm shift. When you're young and you're trying to do things, you're trying to get a reputation, and sometimes you get overwhelmed with all of the successes in life. And you think of yourself, maybe sometimes you can think of yourself as better than someone else. And certainly a lesson that mom taught me, but you get trapped up in it. But I do remember a very humbling experience. And I had to come to this, to terms with this, that it didn't matter how many people I spoke in front of, even if it was a party of one, I was giving them the best presentation they ever had. And it really allowed me to really translate that to, even when I speak in front of thousands of people, I'm still focusing as though my message is for the one. One of the things that I speak about and I coach about is that you cannot serve the many until you serve the one. And if we break that down into a social aspect, it basically says that until you see the humanness of the individual, you won't be able to help them on the plight. You won't be able to help them with where they are because you've only seen the bigger picture, which doesn't take into consideration the importantness of that individual. And have you given that individual hope? Because to break the cycle of helplessness requires hope. And it requires hope on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not on just someone waving a check or helping a big group of people. And although I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying that you get value out of making sure that your message is for the one. So again, another snackable, there we go, another little bite-sized nugget that we've given people who are listening. That's great. You mentioned helplessness, and it makes me think about how I grew up. I also grew up with not very much money. And I feel like my parents did the best that they possibly could for me. I also feel like the mindset that I had when I was younger was shaped by the condition we were in. And it took a lot of work to have a much different mindset today. I'll give you one example. One thing I tend to do is everything. I, I like to do everything myself. And I know that that's not the right way to, to do things if I want to scale and, and grow my business and that kind of thing. Did you have any sort of mindset shift when you grew up and, and what did that look like? Well, what I can really remember is I'm not sure that I was much adventurous at, prior to the age of 12, but I think my mom's encouragement, my mom recognizing that she was actually had an opportunity where she could die and it would be the end that she wanted to make sure that I didn't feel stuck, right? That I was going to be able to spread my wings and go do whatever I needed to do. And as a result, she always encouraged me. Dad always encouraged me too. So mom had a 12th grade education. My dad's education was eighth grade with a military influence. And with a little bit of that encouragement, I began to understand that I wasn't confined by where I was geographically born, that I could make choices and decisions. And I didn't have to leave my family behind just because I moved to another place. And I never thought of myself better. I know this is going to sound terrible to say this out loud, like it all of a sudden it's going to sound like you're very humble when you say something like this, but because we're trying to create a message here, it was very important for me to never think of myself as better than someone else or that I knew more. As a matter of fact, mom said, wouldn't it be better if you were a Mr. Learn-it-all than a Mr. Know-it-all? So you know, all these little nuggets of things, it, it's what really helps me with my mantra today that says that you don't have to know everything. You just need to be teachable. And if you pull all that together and you think of 
of yourself as being a person who's helping others, it keeps your humility in check, right? You don't get bigger or better than anyone else. And so I had all of those experiences. So for me, it wasn't running away from being poor. It was that we could create opportunities that said I wasn't stuck there unless that was a choice I wanted to make. Got it. And you also spoke about traveling the world. And what I'm wondering is in different countries, there are different cultures, there are different leadership styles, different ways of interacting with people. I even know that in New York, if I'm speaking with one group of friends, you're very polite. And when I speak with another group, it's whoever's the loudest gets to speak. How do you deal with different cultures? How do you train people differently in different places? Or is it the same? Well, it was very insightful to make sure that there's several different cultural differences. And of course, I learned this through my PhD. I'm not sure I'd have been so great about it had I not had a, a course in it. But you actually look at things like power distance. You look at the way people treat gender, the gender egalitarianism, how that works, feminine and masculinity, which doesn't always deal with gender, but but deals with how the cultural interactions between uh, feminine and masculine items are treated. So you begin to understand that. And I had a very unique opportunity of putting that in place. And again, I share this idea of what happened, not to make myself sound better than I am, but just because it's a real life experience that occurred. But I did a leadership course at De La Salle University in Manila and I was working with the Asian students at the time. And I do this course where I go around and I ask uh, students or these young individuals that I'm working with, I say, raise your hand if you think you're a leader. And when I, of course, do the adult program, almost everybody raises their hand because they feel like they're a leader, they understand the leadership. But sometimes with the students, I get mixed reactions in the state. But in Asia, when I asked that question in Manila, I got crickets. I mean, no hands raised, nobody moved. It was almost as though I'd said something taboo. And so I had to think for a moment and I was, I'm thinking, gosh, I've done this everywhere else and I always get a reaction and I didn't get anything. It's almost like telling a joke and nobody laughs. So I thought for a moment and said, I need to be teachable. I need to ask why this happened. So I basically asked the question. I said, would anyone care to share with me why you didn't raise your hand? And slowly, the individual started speaking and what they told me was that they don't think of themselves as, with a title leader until they have received a certification or some education that would have deemed it. Now, they have leadership tendencies, so we change the conversation to tell me the kinds of things that you think a leader does that you do, and then it was a much more robust conversation. But had I have applied Western thinking, and would have made those students wrong because they did not raise their hand. Sort of like, well, you should raise your hand. Everyone's a leader and you all know that. And it would have just been a very different experience. So what I learned through the process is that you do have to be open and understanding. And one of the things I also learned, which this is going to be good for the folks who are listening. There's a difference between being culturally superior and being culturally relative. And when you're culturally superior, you look at everything from your vantage point as though it's right, accurate, and you judge everything based on it. When you're culturally relative, it means you're understanding how things happen. What are the culture, the rituals, the, the habits that people have? What are the traditions, the norms? What's the language? And you begin to see how that occurs. And when you can get your mind ready for that, then you can start accepting the diversity, equity, and inclusion that we should be thinking about all the time anyway, because we haven't held ourselves to a higher standard. And I'm not talking about morals. I'm not talking about ethics. I'm talking about culture. I'm talking about the way things happen and making sure that we really have a space to accept people for how they've grown up and what they've been exposed to. Yeah, I agree with you. I do also think that sometimes a culture shapes people in a negative way. So if you're in a country where maybe they're a bit more authoritarian and people aren't allowed to be leaders in whatever way, they're not allowed to become their fullest person. D does that ever get to you? How do you deal with that? Well, it's always challenging when I find that people are oppressed, when they've been marginalized, when they've not been able to be fully expressive. 
Uh, we know through research that when people's safety and security is threatened, they cannot move into the stage of belonging. They don't self-actualize for where they can be fully. So it is challenging. It's just that it's very difficult though for me to go in to another culture and make that culture wrong for what they've had. Now, can I influence the culture with bringing in new ideas and new ways of thinking? I can, and I have a much better opportunity to influence it when I don't make what currently is happening wrong, but I now make it a choice and give people an opportunity to decide, should they do this or could they do that? Much of what I also do through the coaching that I really practice when I'm in these cultural settings is, I ask a lot of open-ended, non-leading questions. If you want self-discovery, if you want people to really become aware, then it's not about you telling, it's about you teaching. And you teach through open-ended, non-leading questions, and you allow people to have that discovery that they need to have. So whether I'm coaching an executive or I'm actually working with a group of individuals in a different culture, I'm finding out as much information as I possibly can and helping them through moments of self-discovery. That makes good sense. It, it really does. When people come to you or when people are thinking about getting a coach, how do they know it's the right time for themselves or the organization? Well, generally they're stopped and they have these ideas of things that they want to do, but they haven't been able to do it. I think Einstein was credited with this, with the saying that, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, but that's really insanity. So when people get sick and tired of being sick and tired, then they raise their hand and they get somebody like me. Got it. And I feel like there's a difference between in-person coaching and, and what you do online. You, you offer both, right? I do, but actually all of my clients, I've coached somewhere in the neighborhood between 75, 80 people last year or through this past year, and um, they were all virtual. I had absolutely no individual that I coached on a face-to-face -face basis. We do it like this through an online platform where individuals were seeing each other. So we're having that connection. We're just not in the room at the same time. Got it. Okay. And then can you tell me, I'm going to give you a little pushback here, but it's an opportunity to sell yourself. Okay, great. What's the difference between just going to YouTube and watching a bunch of videos on this stuff on, on how to be a better leader and build culture and all of that versus doing what we're doing right now, having a conversation? Well, first of all, I think you need to have all kinds of opportunities. Like, I don't know, I still learned from reading a book, but I didn't have a person actually there unless I'm doing an audible and the person's reading the book, which is fine, but there's no interaction. I think it's a variety. I even have an online program. It's called cohesionculturecourse.com. And so it's a five week, five module self-paced program. And one of the things that I offer in the program is to reach out to me for some individual conversation and coaching that comes with it. So you can have some dialogue and you can have some dynamic sort of information that exchanges. And we don't have to be in the same room, but we do need to have a conversation that helps the, the learning. But I wouldn't take away from anyone who learns uh, from an online program of videos or a uh, reading text and, and doing that, but you need to supplement it with conversation and test out what you're learning. I know when I went through the, my PhD program, it's all self-paced, right? It's self-learning aside from a cohort and our interactions through activities like these or postings that we would do, which would be like texting and getting information back and forth and talking and dialoguing in that way. It's all self-paced. You have to learn it yourself. But what I was told is that my real learning and my real opportunity will happen once I start applying it uh, when I completed the degree. So anyone who takes any kind of a course, whether it's online, whether it's a book, whether it's whatever, you should supplement with two ways. One, find someone else you can talk to about it so you can express your ideas because when they live up here, they're brilliant. When they come out here, they're not so brilliant sometimes. And so you need to hear. Them. And so you want to make sure you do that. And the, la and the second thing is start teaching them. Start figuring out a way that you can incorporate them into your everyday life. And how will you internalize what you've learned and then make it worthwhile? Like who wants to sit through a course and not use it? Use it. Sounds good. Now, if I wanted to create a cohesion culture in my organization, how long would that typically take? 
Well, it depends on where you are in the scale. So we do an assessment, a benchmark to help you figure out where you are, and then that will give you an idea as to maybe how much time it might take. If your culture is kind of like sort of there, but really not completely existent, it might take you anywhere from 12 to 18 months to do it. If you have a pretty decent culture where things are kind of there and what I'm doing is augmenting it, then you might see your immediate results within six months. But typically with the assessment tool, what I found over experience is that we do it within a 12 month interval. So you set the benchmark on the first time before you start putting new programs in place. And then a year later, you run the program again. And it's really interesting how we do it is we spread it out. And after the year, we interview the individuals who were there in the beginning, separately from people who came on new. And we use the original benchmark against the new people who came in to say, ah, do they see this culture differently than the people who saw it before? And then we also measure to make sure that the people who had been there also were seeing some differences in the culture. And then that provides great feedback to the client to be able to figure out what they need to do. Now, Dr. Troy, we don't have six, 12 or 18 months, but we do have a few minutes for a snackable solution. Dr. Troy, can you tell us what your snackable solution is? All right. Well, I'm going to say open up your water bottles, get your favorite drink, get ready because here's some popcorn I'm going to give you. So in this little snackable solution, what I would suggest that if you want to determine a little bit about the culture of your organization, it's an exercise I ask every leader to do for two to three weeks before we come in and do an assessment. It's part of what is the discovery phase of what I refer to as the cohesion culture cycle. And in that discovery phase, it's self-discovery. Three things that you either look for or listen to, and they are greetings, laughter, and affirmations. So in the greeting aspect, you want to see how are people interacting? Do they talk to each other when they come in? Do people come in and go directly to the refrigerator and put in their lunch and then go to their desk? What's happening? And who is actually talking? Is it just the entry level people and supervisors? And do they mingle together or do they separate themselves? When I was in Prague with Duke Manufacturing, they call themselves Team Duke. One of the important things I learned from the leadership of that group was that these greetings from leadership was very important, that the employees loved it when the leadership was actually greeting and talking to people and treating them more than just an object who was creating a transaction for the company, but as a real person and actually created some connection. Uh, and that really helps because those greetings help us create belonging. And then the next thing is laughter. Laughter tells us what is the lighthearted temperature within the organization. I ask them to do a scale between one to 10. Tell us where you are. If you think your culture is pretty decent, you might rate it an eight, nine, or a 10. If you think there's a little bit of opportunity for burnout, you've got some stuff happening, there, uh, there are five to seven. But if people are late to work, absenteeism, mistakes are made, the individuals are burnt out. They're a one to four. And that will tell you that you definitely need some additional help. And then the last aspect of it is to look and listen for affirmations. Like, do I build you up? Do I give you credit for work that you do? Do I compliment the things that you do and tell you why what you did matters? People want to know that the work that they do really makes a difference. And so affirmations are your handshakes, your fist bumps, your high fives, your kudos, whatever program you have, you want to make note of who is saying it and what are they saying. If all of the affirmations are at a boy, at a girl, then you haven't added any extra real value to it. And you haven't really determined if there's a shared mutual commitment because you see in a cohesion culture, what you're looking for is belonging value and shared mutual commitment. That is a cohesion culture. That is the strategic framework that you look for. When those three elements are present, you get cohesion. So listen and look for greetings. Listen and look for laughter. Listen and look for affirmations. Dr. Troy, that's really good advice. And I do have one more question outside of the snackable solution. And that is, I feel like we're moving towards a remote workforce and this recent lockdown has only accelerated that process. Can this cohesion culture work in a remote environment? And what does that look like? Well, yes, it can, because 
what you would need to do though is organizations would need to make sure that they have helped their supervisors better understand that belonging doesn't just happen by accident. It's part of a purposeful plan. There are things that we would recommend to organizations to do, whether they are in person or whether they have a hybrid environment, whatever that may be, or they have a remote. The first thing I like to say to you is this. I think organizations need to redefine the word remote. It's not just working from home. Remote is working from anywhere else other than at the corporate headquarters. That's remote because I work sometimes in another person's conference room. I sometimes work in my home office, like you see here where I am. I sometimes work in an airport. I can work in a variety of places that may not normally happen. On the go, I can work. So that's remote work. What's important is to make sure that people feel a sense of belonging, that they have value, not just that they're respected and trusted, which is important, but do they know that the work they're doing is meaningful and has it been connected to others in the organization? And then lastly, shared mutual commitments. But the shared mutual commitment has to first begin with the leader investing in the employee and then the employee invests back into the organization, not the other way around. So those are the opportunities. And so it's a matter of teaching. So again, I have programs I put together to help the uh, organization do it. We look at technology and determine, do you have some technology? What are you doing? We incorporate things like daily huddles, afternoon debriefs, online chat, all kinds of things, just to make sure that people aren't just put out there and are left alone. This is going to become more important in the next few years. Right now, we've managed to get through the pandemic. And how did that happen? Almost two years now, we've been through this. And we've made it through two years because we thought it was going to end. I'm not sure where the end is. The other thing is it was more experienced people who already got along with individuals and everyone was just hunkering down. So again, safety and security, protection, what do we do? We retreat to being protected. We wanna make choices and decisions for that. We don't get to move to belonging. We don't move to self-actualization because we're basically trapped in this protection mode. So we have to make sure that we no longer treat individuals working remotely, regardless of where they're working, where their safety and security is under threat. Now, we can't do anything as an organization from a wellness perspective as far as medically is concerned, but we can make sure the mental aspect of the employee is handled through the ways we interact and connect with them. And I like to say this, really the culture that you have in your organization should extend regardless of where people are, because culture is about how you treat people, not by where they're congregated. That's great advice, Dr. Troy. You really are an expert at this stuff. And I'm sure people would love to know much more about you and to learn much more from you. Where do they find you online? Well, they can go to the website at drtroyhall.com. That's Dr. Troy Hall. That's 10 letters. And if you look at any social media platform, you'll find me at Dr. Troy Hall. So <laughs> it'll be really easy to figure out where to get me. And if you connect with me at any point in time, I'm happy to, to reach back out to you. And I always want to say this. I like to help people and not every conversation is a sales lead. Yeah, that's right. And not everybody has to sign up for your coaching either. You've got a couple of books. So what are those books again? The first book is Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent. And the next book is Fanny Rules, The Mother's Leadership Lessons That Never Grow Old. Both of those books were best-selling titles. And uh, Fanny Rules actually was number one in business and professional humor. Very nice. Dr. Troy, thank you so much for your insight and for your snackable solution. Well, thank you. I hope it was a yummy experience for you. It was certainly great for me.